Okay, this is take number 47,000 of this video to make sure that I actually do it right this time. Let's hope that that's the case. What's happening, Booth Junkies? Mike Delgadio here, back with another video on Home Studio Setup for VoiceOver. And today, we're going to talk about and walk through the Audient Evo 8 interface. Coming up next. So I want to start right off the bat saying that the folks at Audient did send me this interface to review. I'm compensated, I guess, by receiving the interface. I get to keep it. I don't need to send it back, but I'm in no, I've am in received no cash. They're not sponsoring this video. They just sent the unit for me to review. They don't get any editorial input. They just send me the marketing material and the user manual, and they set me off on my way. Um, they don't get to see this video before you do. I try and make them as honest and as unbiased as I can, and I try and let you be the judge of what you hear. So hopefully that's the case. But I will say that I may have some unconscious bias that shows through because I am a regular audience customer. I know and trust the brand, so those uh, biases may come through. Over here, uh, as part of my regular studio setup, that's my recording booth back there, my regular studio setup does have an Audient ID44 interface. And if you can see right here, this unit right here, this is an Audient ASP880 uh, 8 preamplifier interface for some of my other work that I need to do. I've also purchased other Audient uh, products that are not here in the booth right now. So I've purchased with my own money a bunch of Audient stuff. I'm a fan, so my biases may show through. All right, so right off the bat, I want to talk about why I'm reviewing this. And if you're a voice actor and you're sitting through, you're thinking, why would I sit through a review on a more expensive device with four microphone inputs? That doesn't apply to me. I'm going to punch out on this video and I'll, I'll encourage you to stick around with me for three more minutes before you punch out. And then if you decide to punch out, more better for you. The reason I'm reviewing the Evo 8 and the, the reason I'm really interested and I'm sort of excited about the Evo 8 is what it does for the voice actor in their home studio setup. It's the same reason that if you followed my channel for a long time, you know that I, I for a long time I used the Audient ID22 and then I switched to the Audient ID44, even though that's a four microphone input and I really only ever use one microphone when I'm recording my voiceover. Why did I go with a four input? Why would I go with a four input for the Evo 8? It's not necessarily about the inputs. It's about all the rest of the stuff that you can do with it. And I especially think about it from a future proofing of your studio and setting up your studio that if you can spend a couple of extra dollars now, you're going to save yourself money in the long run. What do I mean? So with my setup and what I've seen a lot of voice actors do over time is they record in one place, the booth, and then they mix and they edit and they, they fix their audio in their control room side. So you've got two different locations where you do your work. You have your recording booth and you have your control room is what I call mine here. It's all run by one computer. So right below the camera, there's a computer right here. And that is connected to the booth in there. There's a second monitor and that's just my second monitor. Instead of them being side by side, there's another monitor in there. There's a keyboard and a mouse connected by Bluetooth over here. There is um, a headphone jack that goes back to this computer over here. There's two different places that as a voice actor, you'll work, especially as you start to outgrow your booth or you work a lot more, you realize it gets hot in there. That's not necessarily the, the best place to edit. You want to have a place to edit and a place to record. The Evo 8 can accommodate that situation much better than its little brother, little sibling, the Evo 4, which only has two microphone ins, but it only has one headphone out as opposed to the two headphone out, two monitor out of the Evo 8. That's a really big difference. That's it's a it's a bigger difference than you might expect. Why would I need two sets of headphones? Why would I need two sets of monitors? We're going to talk about it, but it really can change how you work and it can really make how you work more efficient. Something to think about. So let's take a look at the everything that you see on the device itself. There's a piece of software that goes along with the device called the Evo software, the Evo mixer. Let's talk about the device itself and we'll see how the mixer comes into play. 
on a Mac, at least, the Evo 8 is a plug, plug and play device. If you just want to use it, use it as an interface and just use the buttons on the front, it will work just fine. If you want to get some of the advanced features, if you want to do a lot of the time saving stuff, you'll need to install the Evo software that comes with it. And we'll talk about how they work together with some of the different features. Let's first just quickly go over what's on the device itself. Starting on the back, let me unplug these headphones. Starting on the back, let's see, can I get that in focus for you? Starting on the back, this is your uh, where everything plugs in part. As I said before, there are four microphone inputs. I have two going right now. I've got a condenser microphone and a dynamic microphone with two spares for later, either guests or if I want to have other inputs, perhaps I want to have my... Uh, uh, audio player, or something else plug in there. You have two more inputs for another another input. Keyboard, instruments, anything you want. There are two sets of monitor outputs, two sets of individually addressable monitors. That can be helpful in a couple of different ways. You can have some what some studios do is they have some high fidelity monitors and they've got some low fidelity monitors so that you can simulate what it would sound like through a, a you know a phone speaker or a car stereo or something like that. So they've got the ones where they're making the really critical decisions and then they're evaluating decisions with two sets of monitors. Sometimes you'll have monitors in two sets of locations. That's a possibility. Sometimes you might wanna have monitors so that you can hear your speakers, but you might wanna send a separate output to your stream, your live stream. You could actually set this uh, output to go into another device. So in this case, I might plug these into my ATEM Mini because I can have a separate output, separate, two separate outputs going to two separate locations. Pretty cool. It gets its power from this here. This is a USB-C plug. Uh, there's a little bit of a nuance with the USB-C, which we're going to talk about, but this is a USB-C device. That's how it gets its power. There's, you see there's no, no separate power switch or anything like that. Moving around to the uh, part that faces you, uh, not necessarily the part that you uh, interact with all that much, but there is a direct input. So if you do have an instrument that you want to put directly in and bypass all the other guts, there's the DI input that's right there. And there's two separate headphone outputs. Again, this could be two separate locations Two uh, it could be a host and a guest. It could be the control room and the artist. There's two different sets of headphones. In my case, this is my uh, mixing headphones. And this is my recording headphones. So I am both the engineer and the artist. I have two separate sets of headphones that I can use to record. So even if my computer's not nearby, I can set uh, two different uh, two different headphone mixes. It's a bigger deal than you might think. It's really super helpful. Going more to the business end here, the front that we'll talk about, there's a, there's a bunch of different buttons that we'll go over each and they most of them have uh, more than one function. Some of them have more than one function. Uh, just working from left to right. The first one, the top here, this red button that uh, is illuminated right now says 48V. This is the uh, button for phantom power. You choose a microphone and then you choose if you want to have phantom power applied to it. Press it again to turn it off. It, if it's red, there is phantom power applied. So in this case, my microphone in mic one is a condenser microphone. 48 volts is applied. An important note is I, before I talked about the USB-C connector, the USB-C connector that's that's in the back, if you are plugging in to a computer with a USB-A plug, that's the old school rectangular plug, that protocol only has enough power to power two condenser microphones. It can only do 48 volts to two microphones. If you want to send 48 volts to all four, say if you're miking up a drum set with all condenser microphones or something like that, you do need to make sure that you're connected over USB-C. USB-C can provide enough power over the, over the output uh, to turn on 48 volts for all four. There's no other way to get power to the device. It's got to be over the USB-C. So if you want, if you are going to do a podcast with four, uh, four condenser mics, just make sure you're using a uh, USB-C cable that can handle the power and make sure your source can supply it. MacBook can. The four buttons below it refer to the, each of the four microphones. One, two, three, four. You can choose up to four microphones and depending on the, whichever one you press last, the button or the knob here is going to adjust whichever mic you've pressed. So you just got to get in the habit of pressing the microphone it will illuminate what the current gain is set at. So you notice when I press it, 
it goes up to a certain gain level. And then after a second, it will go back to show you a meter. Consider these meters a guide and not the end all be all. The end all be all of the, of the metering is in the software, but consider this just as a rough guide. When you touch it and you look at the gain, it's uh, one of these illuminated LEDs, but you do need to know that each LED is multiple state. So as you scroll through, the knob itself has some detents, uh, and I think there's five increments per LED, and you see them getting brighter and dimmer as we move. So you can't. It's hard to be ultra precise um, with the LEDs if you if you're trying to get back to uh, a gain setting before you have to say, oh, I was five from the end on the third level of brightness. It's a little bit finicky. But in the software, in the Evo software, you can go back to and have it memorize exactly where the gain should be. So just remember that these LEDs are a guide. Uh, same thing with the metering. You see that as I go up, uh, as I uh, talk more loudly into it, you see that the meter itself doesn't turn red as the signal gets loud, even to the point of potentially clipping. The meter doesn't really change here. Blah, 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 blah. You will get a little bit of a red light on the input itself, but I'll say it's it's hard to see. So these meterings, eh, it's not necessarily. Now I realize I've messed with the gain a little bit. So on gain one, I'm going to turn it down a little bit. This metering is just a guide, something that you can refer to as a, at a glance. I wish that guide, I wish that had multicolored LEDs so that I could see if I was in the yellow or going up into the red. Um, I wish I could, but I can't. I can't. This green button is called Smart Gain. We'll come back to that in a second. But over here, we have the two other buttons, and these are the output volume. Not necessarily headphone volume, not necessarily monitor volume. It's a little bit of both. Um, so, but you have two different sets, and the way I'm, I'm sort of, you know, hemming and hawing because these, uh, these jacks are headphone override. So, if there is no headphone plugged into the unit, the 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 monitor jacks on back are hot. They get the priority. So the monitors on the back get the priority. So if you've got a set of monitors plugged into input one or output one. You've got your monitors plugged in. Those have priority. As soon as you plug a headphone in, these jacks go dead and this Mac, this gets hot. So if you call it duplexing or, or whatever, but these are headphone override. These have priority. These override. Uh, the headphone overrides. And that goes for both of them. So know that you can leave them plugged in, but this volume adjustment adjusts whichever one is hot. It, it's, it's actually adjusting it for both. So if you if you turn up your headphones, when you unplugged your headphones, your monitors, I believe, will be hotter too. Uh, will be louder. So just bear that in mind. When you unplug it, the monitors go hot again, and you can adjust it. You can adjust the gain. Or adjust the volume, not the gain, sorry. Uh, so you can do that for either one of them. Most of these buttons, or all of these buttons, uh, the, both the microphones and the and the uh, headphones, they have a second feature, a muting feature, which is incredibly, incredibly helpful. I actually wish I had this setting on my interface also. If you want to mute a mic or if you want to mute a headphone, just long press the button, takes about two seconds, and it should, can you see that? Not sure if it's bright enough, but let's see. You should see that it's flick, uh, that it's flashing. The, uh, the button itself is flashing. That means that channel is muted. If you press it again, you can unmute it. Long press, hold it for a couple of seconds. But that means, so if you're going to cough, if you're doing a podcast or something, something like that, you can mute the microphone. Many of the interfaces that I've seen, you can't mute the microphone. You can maybe shut off phantom power for a second. You'll get a huge click. You'll get a huge bump um, in the microphone. Real pain. You don't want to do that. Um, or you have to have a separate muting switch, a push button, a, a switch to mute the microphone. Having that built in, super, super handy. The same happens with the headphones. If you want to mute a headphone, you just press and hold that for a couple of seconds, and it should flash. You see it flashing now. That means that the output is is muted. Your headphones or your monitors are muted. Where is that super helpful? Well, 
let's say that you are in a mixing session. You're, you, you're trying to do some critical listening to what you've recorded. You're checking for breaths or mouth, mouth clicks for all that. And the phone rings. What you don't want to do is you don't want to turn your monitors down because you may have a hard time finding exactly where it was before. And if you're mastering with two different sets of levels, you, be ma- you may be making different decisions. So if the phone rings, press and hold for two seconds, kill your monitors, take your phone call. When you're done, unmute, and you can go right back to your mixing session. You don't have to mess with the volume of your monitors. Super, super helpful. I wish they all had that. Some of them have a, a dim or a cut. Um, not all of them, though. You might have to turn that knob down and remember exactly where it was. Or, you know, put notes or pieces of tape that show where your different uh, levels are for different things. Not so with this one. You can just mute it and then bring it back. Really helpful. Okay. I danced around it before, but there's a button over here, this great big green button. This is a special, believe it, it's a proprietary feature to the Evo product. This is called Smart Gain. There are other products that have similar uh, similar technology, but uh, Evo's is called Smart Gain. And what this does is this helps you set the gain of the microphone to reduce the likelihood that you're going to clip, that you're going to record too loudly and run the risk of distorting your software or distorting your recording in software. <laughs> uh, so let's imagine that, it, it, let me talk about gain for just one more second. So if you're new, if you're new to recording and you're trying to decide if this is the right thing for you, if you're recording with a particular input and you turn that input way up, way up, it can potentially distort. You need to sort of be cognizant of how loud your gain is set so that you don't accidentally distort your recording by recording it too loudly. The Evo device is trying to help you with that by allowing you to set the gain automatically. So if you just have your script, if you have your song or whatever it is, and you perform, consider it a rehearsal take for 10 or 15 seconds, it will help you establish that gain. So you press the smart gain button, it illuminates green. You then choose which microphone you want to set the gain to, and then you set it again. It will switch to a red icon, and you'll get this animation here on the device itself that says it's evaluating. So in this case, it's listening to the volume of my voice, and it's trying to set an appropriate gain so that this will be as, as loud a signal as it can be, but give it plenty of headroom so that I don't clip takes, I don't know, 10 or 15 seconds worth of recording to do it. And when the when it stops, it will show you what the gain is that it's set and it will go back to the meter. And now that gain is set. As long as your volume stays somewhere close to what you just did in the re, in the sample recording, that gain is going to be set. Super, super helpful. Okay, so I think we've covered all of the functions on this. This, uh, this uh, knob is whichever the last thing you touched, that's what the knob is going to govern. So whether it's the gain, whether it's the headphone, whatever it is, just remember to touch the thing, touch the, uh, the, 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 the part you want to work with, and then the knob becomes activated for, for that section. Before, when I mentioned that the, the, the LEDs and so forth, they can be a little bit imprecise. If you switch over to the actual Evo software itself, that's where you actually see the specifics of what you're working with. So the Evo software is a separate, it, it's free, but it, it gets installed separately from the, the device itself. So when you plug the device in, in Windows, I think there's some drivers. On Mac, it's plug and play. But the Evo software really gives you a drive-by-wire for everything on the device. So if you have the device in your booth, you can still uh, you can still adjust everything about it here at your computer. If you have the device next to your computer, because it's also your sound card, you can also put it on a second screen. You can put the software on a second screen in your booth and you can still adjust it. Here is where you can see exactly where your gain is set. You can toggle your phantom power on and off. You can see the actual meters to know if you're going into the yellow or to the red or anything like that. You actually have control over the software itself. So if it does look like it's getting a little too hot, you can actually adjust the gain. And you see it's actually changing the, the device itself, but you can adjust the gain on the microphone directly from the computer. 
super helpful. My Audient ID44, which costs three times as much as the Evo 8, can't can't do that. If I need to adjust the gain on the microphone, I need to come out here and, and adjust it. And many times I put a piece of tape with a marker on it so I can see exactly where that gain was. Really helpful that you can do it all by wire here. Really, really helpful. What I found with the Evo devices themselves is when you unplug them, when you remove power, the settings will revert to a default. So the phantom power may get turned off. Your gain settings may change that when you reapply power, those settings may not be exactly the same. So what's a good habit to get into is set first your gains for your typical microphone, for your typical headphones, set, set the device exactly the way you want it, and then come into the Evo software and do file save. And that will save the configuration directly uh, on your computer. So you can always load that back in. But where it also gets extra helpful is you may have different settings for different projects. If you're doing um, an animated character that's a really loud character, lots of screaming and yelling, you might have your preamplifier set differently than if you're recording an e-learning module where the gain needs to be up higher. So by using the save configuration, you can actually save the state of the mixer and have it there for your project. So if you're working on an audiobook or if you're working on a character, you can just save that configuration right here in the, con in the configuration save and then always go back to it. So even if you don't remember that it was five LEDs from the end at the third, bright <laughs> third brightest, you can always go back to it if you just remember to save your configuration. My other devices, they don't, they don't do that. So what I've had to do, and I've done this for a long time, is before each project, I will slate myself with my project notes. I'll say, okay, we're recording this on November 20th, and we're using the Sennheiser MKH416, and we're going into input one of the Audient ASP880. The gain is set at four or the three o'clock position or whatever it is, I'll make notes to myself so I can go back. Some people take a picture of their device so they can go back and set the knobs and they put a JPEG, a photograph in their project settings. Wouldn't it be amazing if you could just go and say, I just want to save that configuration and pull it back whenever I need it. You can absolutely do that with the Evo 8. Super, super cool. Really handy. It's my understanding that if you use Logic, um, the DAW Logic that uh, is made by Apple, sold by Apple, um, they actually, Logic can actually save, at least the gain settings, can save some of the settings and communicate them back to the Evo 8 uh, and the Evo 4. Um, but if you're not using that, I use Reaper, I use a different DAW, I would use the save configuration. Uh, I don't know, I, I haven't been able to test the Logic functionality because I don't use Logic. Uh, but having that ability to save the state of the mixer, incredibly, incredibly helpful. You'll always be able to just go back to it. You'll be able to go back to your default setting. So if, if the way I have it set now, if this was just my default, I'd, I'd say that this was my default config. I click save. I would always be able to go back to that. So let's say I was working on an audiobook. I can bring those configurations back. And then if I was going to switch back to my default configuration, I just go back to default and I can bring those back. So I can actually just really quickly change between configurations for my different projects. So if I'm jumping from my audiobook project to my animated character project to my e-learning project to anything else that I've got going, I can save those different projects itself. Incredibly, incredibly helpful. A couple of other things to know about the, um, the um, Evo software. Um, it will uh, ride in your tray up here in, on the Mac. Um, you, do, you, you should have it, if you're going to use this as your main interface, just have the software start when the, when the system starts. Otherwise, you may have to remember to bring this back up to open the Evo software when you are recording. Because it, if, uh, if it's not open, it won't be interacting with the device itself. So just remember, I keep mine. Uh, the ID44 also has software. I just have it open with startup. Um, the mic, uh, microphone preamplifier controls by default are not displayed. Not sure why they made that decision, but you do have to remember to go to file, show mic pre-controls. If you want to see the gain and toggle phantom power, 
I wish those were just displayed all the time. I'm not sure why they're not, uh, but you do have to remember to use that view menu. Finally, if you do want to have a separate um, separate mix of um, if you're recording music or something like that, and the and the second set of headphones, if they want a different mix than what you as the engineer will hear, uh, they'll say, "Could you make the bass louder, or could you turn down the guitars?" And you don't want to mess with your um, your settings. If if they want to hear something different from what you're hearing, in the setup menu, you can choose Enable Artist Mix, and that allows you to to do a separate mix in the headphones uh, for them. Finally, not something I can show here, but it's described in the manual, is the Evo software also has a loopback function. So if you are using this and you're doing a podcast or you're doing something where there's a remote person, a guest, say over Skype or some other remote system, and you want to bring their audio and record that audio, but not send it back down the line to them, what might be called a mix minus setup, you could use the loopback function and have that choose which which signal goes back down the line to the guest and which ends up in your DAW. Uh, so you can actually choose that here. Hard for me to demonstrate here, but just know that there is a mix minus capability built into the uh, into the Evo. They call it loopback here, but you can actually choose which gets which gets looped back uh, down to the down the line to the to the remote side. Super super helpful. Hard for me to demonstrate here, but know that it exists. When you buy it, you may end up um, having to update the firmware. Um, Audient has been making updates. They've made updates to the Evo 4. They've made updates to the Evo 8. So if they do find that through usage, if they find a bug, know that um, there could be uh, firmware updates. You can always tell the software to go and check for updates, and it will go out and pull the Audient servers to see if there's anything that, that needs to get updated. I think the version as I'm working with it today was 1.3.3, uh, but mine was shipped with uh, 1.2.5, so I do the firmware upgrade, and it just goes out to the Audient servers and, and will download it, and it takes uh, took about 90 seconds, maybe, all, all told, to download the software, reboot the machine a couple of times, and have it be good to go. So it will update the firmware from time to time. Really helpful. So, a lot of talking, but there's a lot of functionality in this little box here. I have, hope you found that helpful. I hope it helps. If you're trying to decide if this is the right one for you, then I hope, I hope this video helped you make a decision on whether or not this is the right product for you. It may not be right for everybody, but I wanted to show you everything that it does and to tell you my opinion, which I told you up front, that I think it's a, I think it's a more future-proof option than the Evo 4. And then a lot of the other two-channel um, input devices the four channels is handy but it's the it's the multi outputs that i really think sets the evo apart at the price point at its capabilities the ability to to memorize those configurations bring them back with a with the push of a button have separate outputs for monitors whether or not you're sending it to your primary monitors and to a stream two separate headphone mixes incredibly incredibly handy great sounding preamplifiers uh, sufficiently loud headphones, uh, headphone preamplifiers, as long as you're using a relatively low impedance headphones. I got, I got no complaints. I got no complaints. Um, but perhaps that's my bias showing through. Just want you to know that. But that's all I have for you today. I hope that helps. I hope it does. I really do hope it does. Now, get yourself a microphone. Get yourself an interface. Maybe the Audient Evo 8. Maybe another one, but maybe the Evo 8. But get yourself a microphone. Get into a booth and record something amazing. Great. We'll talk to you next time. Thanks.